So in my previous couple videos, I'm looking at forces of constraint in Lagrangian problems and finding the force of constraint. And so I did this problem of a block on an incline and I found the force of constraint. It was a great time. I had fun. I hope you had fun. Everyone had fun. But I thought, hey, what if I did this again, but I use polar coordinates? So in, in Cartesian coordinates, I can say something like y equals ax is the constraint. It has to stay on this line. But in polar coordinates, I'm going to say that uh, it has some, it, I find the location of this as r and theta, and then theta is some constant value. So the constraint here would be theta minus theta zero is equal to zero. That's, that's how I do that. So let's set this up. So remember, in, uh, if I want to find, use Lagrange multipliers to find the equation of constraint, it looks like this the partial of L with respect to QI, one of the variables, plus lambda partial of F with respect to QI equals the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to QI dot, where that's one of the generalized coordinates, QI and QI dot. And then F is going to be this function right here. So F of R and theta in this case is going to be theta minus theta zero. So let's get to it. We need to write down the Lagrangian in polar coordinates. I've done this a bunch of times. I'm going to do it the best way because I don't want to, it, it's good to review these things. It's not, it's not bad to review them. Um, so, you know, here's my Lagrangian. L is T minus U and T is hard to write except in Cartesian coordinates. So I can say it's one half M X dot squared plus Y dot squared. And then I can say U is M G Y. That's easy. So I want to get those in terms, I want to get it in terms of R and theta. Remember, I'm going to under constrain this. So I'm going to let it move in both the R and theta direction and then apply the constraint. So if I don't do that, I can't, I can't find the force of constraint. So the best way to do this is to say, well, I can write X and Y in terms of R and theta. So I can say X is R cosine theta, Y is R sine theta. I can take the derivatives of both sides, square it, and plug it in over here. So if I do that, x dot is going to be the time derivative of this side. Now r and theta could both change with time. So I have a product rule here. This is going to be r dot times cosine theta plus r times the derivative of, of this, which is going to be minus r theta dot sine theta. So I took the derivative of cosine, I got minus sine, then I have to take the derivative of the inside theta, which is theta dot. And let's do the same thing for y dot. It's going to be r dot sine theta plus r theta dot cosine theta. Now I need to square both of these terms. So I'm going to say x dot squared is going to be equal to this squared, r dot squared cosine squared theta, my, uh, then I get two of the cross terms, minus two r, r dot theta dot cosine theta sine theta, and then I get this squared plus r squared theta dot squared sine squared theta. And then y dot squared is going to be r dot squared, that's sine squared theta, plus two r, r dot theta dot cosine theta sine theta plus r squared theta dot squared cosine squared theta. Now if I add these two together, something magic happens. These two things cancel. Here I get uh, r dot squared cosine squared theta, r dot squared sine squared theta, and the, I factor out the r dot squared and I get cosine squared plus sine squared, which is one. So it's gonna give me r dot squared. Same thing over here, I can factor out the r squared theta dot squared, and I'm left with sine squared plus cosine squared, which is one, plus r squared theta dot squared. So that's my x dot squared plus v dot squared. And you'll notice this is the, the velocity in the polar direction. This is the velocity this way, right? r dot, how r dot changes. And this is the angular velocity, r times theta dot, and they have to square it, right? The velocity that way. I've done that a bunch of times. I could probably do that with my eyes closed. So that means I have, oh, and then I can use this for my potential energy, r sine theta times mg. So now I have my Lagrangian. It's going to be 1 half m r dot squared plus r squared 
theta dot squared minus m g r sine theta. And remember, f of r and theta is equal to theta minus theta naught. Now I can do, let's do the Lagrange equation in the r direction. So I'm going to say uh, the partial of L with respect to R plus lambda partial of F with respect to R equals the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to R dot. So let's do the first part, partial of L with respect to R. If I go through here and look for the R's, there's one right there. So I'm going to get 1 half M times that and take the the partial respect to r, I'll bring the 2 down, and I'll get m r theta dot squared. Here I have another r term, so it's just r to the first power, so I just get minus m g sine theta. Now I need to do this part, so the partial of f with respect to r is equal to, well there's no r in there, so this is 0. Now I need to do this, the partial of l with respect to r dot, I'm looking for r dot to my term up here. There's only one. So I just bring down the 2, and I get m r dot. Now I need to take the derivative, time with respect to time, partial of L with respect to r dot is going to be, well, m's constant, so I just get m r double dot. Now I can put this all together. So I have, I have this, m r theta dot squared minus m g sine theta, that's, that's that part, plus lambda times zero, so I'll just put zero, equals m r double dot. So I'll rewrite that, the masses cancel, and I'll write that as r double dot equals r theta dot squared minus g sine theta. And it's important, so I'm going to put a box around it. Now let's do the one for theta. Same thing. There's my two equations, the partial of L with respect to theta. Okay, I'm looking for thetas. That's a theta dot, doesn't count. Here's one. So if I take the derivative of sine theta, I'm going to get cosine theta. So I'm going to get minus m g r cosine theta. And that's it. Now I need the partial of f with respect to theta, just one. Now I need the partial of L with respect to theta dot. There's a theta dot. So I'm going to get the 2 comes down. I get m r squared theta dot squared. Now I'm going to take the derivative with respect to time of that. Now be careful. r and theta, depend on theta dot depend on time. So I have to use the product rule. So let's take the derivative of m r squared first. That's going to be 2 <coughs> m r r dot theta dot squared, right? So I take the derivative, bring the 2 down front, and I have 2mr, but then I have to take the derivative of r, which is r dot. Now I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to say, should there be a 1 half? No. That's not that. That's theta dot. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, take the derivative of just the theta dot, and I get 2m r squared theta double dot. Now I can put this all together, and I get, uh, I'll put it right here. I'll put it right here. I get, no, I'll put it right here. m negative m g r cosine theta plus 1 times lambda equals 2 m r r dot theta dot plus 2 m r squared theta double dot. Um, again, the mass does not cancel here, right, because there's a lambda right there. Um, so there's, I'm going to put a box around this equation. And then here was that other equation I had, r double dot equals r theta dot squared. minus g sine theta. And so, and then we had this constraint. Remember, theta, that's another equation. 
theta minus theta zero is equal to zero. That's a constant angle. And really what I'm looking for is the force of constraint F C theta is going to be equal to lambda partial of F with respect to theta. And that's what I want to find. I want to find the constraint force. Um, there's no constraint in the R direction. We didn't do that. There's no R is there anyway. Okay, so that means I need to solve for lambda. Uh, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and solve this for theta. Theta equals theta zero. And now I can take the derivative of both sides and I get theta dot equals zero. Theta double dot equals zero. Because it didn't change, right? And I can apply the constraint. Now if I put that constraint in these two equations, they become something different. So this equation becomes negative m g r cosine theta plus theta zero plus lambda equals, okay, right here I have a theta dot. So it doesn't matter what all that stuff is. That's just zero. And then right here, but theta double dot, that's zero too. So I can go ahead and solve for lambda. Lambda is going to be m g r cosine theta zero. So that means f c theta is this times one, m g r cosine theta. And that's my force of constraint. But it's not a force, not a force, not a Newton force. This is a constraint in the theta variable. Okay, I'll get to that in just a second. Let me look back over here at this. If I put in that same condition up here, I get r double dot. This is going to be zero, so it's going to be negative g sine theta zero. That's kind of useful, right? Because that's the acceleration down the plane. We knew that, um, and I'm going to show that this is the acceleration, and that is the. This is technically, since um, this is actually. Uh, shows the change in the, the the p theta momentum. I don't know if I want to get into this, but let's say p theta is equal to the partial of L with respect to theta dot. That's how we define momentum the uh, in this situation. So if I go back up to my Lagrangian right here and I take the partial respect to theta dot, I get uh, m r squared theta dot. And if you look at that, what does that look like? This is an angular velocity. mr squared, this is the moment of inertia. So this is uh, essentially, I'm going to put an arrow because I omega, right? This is the angular moment. This is actually angular momentum. And so what changes angular momentum is a net torque, not a net force. So this is actually the torque constraint. And that's why there's an R there. So let's go ahead and get the actual force. So let's draw a picture. Here's theta. This is this. I have a normal force, I'll call it n, that I'm trying to find right there. Uh, and this is r. And I want to find n. So I know that the torque is going to be about this point O. It's going to be r times n. And that's going to be equal to what my force of constraint, Fc theta. And that's this, mgr cosine theta. mgr cosine theta zero. So if I, if I divide both sides by r, I get n. n equals mg cosine theta. OK, let's check that with Newtonian mechanics because it's pretty easy uh, in Newtonian mechanics to look at this. I'm going to call this my x direction and this my y direction. I have two forces. I have the downward gravitational force, mg. I have the upward normal force, n. Uh, and I know that in the y direction, f net y, in this direction, the net force has to be zero because the acceleration is zero. It stays on the plane. So that means I have n minus the component, the y component of this, which if this is theta, zero, that's theta, zero, too. So that this is going to give me minus mg cosine theta zero. So n equals mg cosine theta zero. So the same thing. OK, now let's look at the x direction, f net x. What forces are there in the x direction? I only have a component of the gravitational force, negative mg sine theta zero. And that's going to be m, uh, let's call that x double dot. 
that's the acceleration in the x direction. If I solve for that, x double dot is negative g sine theta, which I called the r, r direction, and that's the same also. Okay, so there's forces of constraint, another way uh, to find it. And again, you wouldn't do it in this situation. You would, it's easier to do it in Newtonian mechanics. Why would you do all this other mess, right? Um, and the reason is because it's, it's best to start off with a situation that you do understand before moving to more complicated situations, like with a curving plane or something like that. Okay, the end. I'll talk to you later.